I uh, worked for him for six years guiding and, uh, and working on his ranch. He came up with a good solution, though. He came up with Cowboy College, which was great. We brought people in, and they paid us to do our job. It was a wonderful thing. You know, they, they built fence. They helped us move cows. But anyway, you know, the, these are the only two slides you're going to see that have words on them. Other than that, there's going to be no words on any of the slides. They're just going to be random pictures of, of conserved lands and people involved back up in the Durango area. And I titled this People and Environment because too often I think that we have this dichotomy where we have environment and environmentalists and then we have people and people don't fit into what people perceive as, as the environment. I have this discussion with my friend Dave Foreman quite often. He believe, firmly believes that, that people don't belong out in what he considers to be the wilderness, and I do. So we have, we have that. We've managed to keep that civil, unlike politicians. But anyway, I am not an environmentalist. I don't like the word. Uh, it's gotten too much negative publicity lately. I'm a conservationist. Uh, probably one of my heroes in that regard was Teddy Roosevelt, who, uh, you know, believed in using the land but preserving it and protecting it. And of course, Aldo Leopold with the environmental ethic. And just a little more background about myself. I, I came to this came to this part of my life and came to this job through a whole series of events. I grew up in a farm in the uh, Midwest. And after uh, a little stint in college, like Allison said, I dropped out, I moved west, I became a cowboy, I did a whole bunch of other stuff. I was what they called a day worker. I would drift from ranch to ranch and area to area and state to state and just kind of, I got to see a lot of the country. and. It was, you know, it was a great way to live, terrible way to make a living, but a great way to live. But as the years went on, it got tougher and tougher to do that because the ranches, the big ranches were getting cut up and they were getting turned into housing developments and McMansions everywhere. And I was getting, you know, Getting to the point of okay, it's getting harder and harder to do this. What can I do? That's uh, what can I do to maybe protect some of what's left? And when I went back to visit back in the Midwest where I grew up, the farms were all gone too. They were all subdivisions. And I became aware of the land trust movement years and years ago. And the way I became aware was through the Nature Conservancy, you know, which is the big boy. But the Nature Conservancy amongst working cowboys and ranchers really didn't have a good reputation back then. They believed that the Nature Conservancy just wanted to put land in an easement, kick the cows off of it, and just kind of let it go back to nature and take away people's way of making a living. And for a long time that was true. And then I got involved in the holistic land movement I was down here in Arizona. I went down to New Mexico and worked with Alvin Savory and a bunch of other people. And one of the big conferences we had was at Chico Basin Ranch, was out, which is out in eastern Colorado. I don't know if any of you have been out there, but it's a high plains ranch. One of the owners was Goose Gossage, the baseball pitcher. And it was also a nature conservancy project where they finally realized that if they wanted to really make some inroads, they really needed to, to make some adaptations in the way they operated. And so we did a holistic grazing conference out there. And it was, uh, it was very well done. And I think the results were very good. And that got me into looking at land trusts a little bit deeper at that point. And I realized that a lot of them back then, particularly in the East, were there to protect, they were to protect the wilderness. Again, there was a lack of, lack of conservation 
for working landscapes to keep the people, people on the land. How many of you, how many of you think that there's any place in the world that hasn't been affected by what man does? Does anyone believe that? Where, where is that? Do you think man has never been in places in Arizona? since man has existed. We've been on landscapes. And we're part of the environment. And when I got to when I got to school, when I was first in school taking wildlife biology, it was a matter of uh, of trying to figure out where man's place was. And we've never answered that question. I had a really good discussion with the students in uh, Allison's uh, class today. We talked about what is man's place on the landscape? And part of it is our culture. We have, here in the Southwest, we have, you know, we're kind of tri-culture. You know, we have the native, native peoples who were here before. We have the Hispanic settlers who came in later. And then we have the Anglo settlers who came in after that. We have all these cultures down here that all work this landscape in different ways. Like, like Phoenix. Phoenix was built, when the city was built, all the irrigation and stuff was actually the old, the old native irrigation systems were there, were just dug out by the settlers and, and reworked to, to build up the uh, irrigation system for Phoenix. And so we look at that over time, and I'm personally, I am all three cultures. I am Hispanic, I am Native American, and I'm also Scots and Irish and English and German and who knows what else from that side of the family. But in the time that I've been out on the landscape since I got into the land trust, trust business, I've found that there's a real lack of understanding what land trusts do. And I'm glad there's a whole bunch of land trust people in here now. There's board members and uh, staff people. And maybe you found the same thing education and outreach become more and more important, which is the reason I do things like this. But I'm not going to stand here and just talk for a half hour. What I really want to do is I want to, I want to start engaging you in a conversation. I want to know what you know about land trusts, what you think about conservation, what you think about preservation. And then let's have that dialogue and see how it ties into, into land trusts. I will say our land trust is one of the early ones for actually in, engaging the farming and ranching community. We've been very successful at that. We've also taken in some small properties where we allow the owners to engage in small scale farming and stuff. And sometimes the numbers don't work out. It's a little tough to get it going. I'm not going to get too much into, into land trust details because we have our local land trust here that's going to talk about how you work locally here, Colorado and Arizona are somewhat different. But how many people here are, is there anybody here that's a working cowboy or a rancher who, or who has ever done that? Okay, do we have any farmers in here? Great, how many uh, people in here like to ride mountain bikes? <laughs> All right, how about, how about hiking? Yeah, we're, look at that, the numbers just keep increasing. Cross-country skiing, bird watching, hunting. All right, so all these things depend on open land. They depend <coughs> on open space. And they are the reason, they're the reason most of us live here. One or more of these things is the reason we live here and we stay here. So if we were to go back to that old model of locking up land and kicking people off. Well, you know, what would we, you know, what would we accomplish? Yeah, there'll still be some people will stay here because they can still drive through and see it, but would you, what kind of enjoyment would you get out of the land? So land trust had moved into, into things like we preserve land exactly for bicycle riding. But we tie that with the conservation. 
and we don't see any problem with that. We can tie recreation and conservation together. We can tie sustainable agriculture and, and land conservation together. As a matter of fact, we encourage it. Because to me, if you're doing sustainable work on the land, you are increasing the conservation of the land. You are allowing more wildlife, more species diversity than just a sterile environment. And many of the, many of the things with the holistic management program that we've demonstrated time and again is you can use proper grazing techniques to actually enhance your landscapes and to, again, increase your wildlife. So, so we encourage the use of our lands and the enjoyment of the lands we have. Now when you, when you have properties under easement, it's up to the landowner whether they're going to allow public access or not, obviously. And not all of them do. But part of my job lately has been to engage our new landowners because we're getting into the second generation where our, the donors have either passed on or they've sold off or their sons have taken it over, sons or daughters. And so I'm engaging them in the conversation of, can we allow some public access? Can we bring some people in once a year to, uh, to look at the birds you have? Uh, Zinc's Pond is one example we have. And you'll see a picture somewhere on there of people out there at Zinc's Pond. Jerry Zinc is also our board president. Zinc's Pond is like an oasis in the, in the desert southwest in that it's spring fed. So it's open all, all year. It doesn't get filled with ice. So there's always ducks and geese and birds around. And, and he allows people, to groups, to come in there and, and uh, you know, watch that kind of thing. So given that, I want to ask, I want to ask somebody some questions in here, and I'm not, I don't care who answers. Who sees the connection between uh, public land and private land? What kind of connection do there be? Anybody? Yes, sir. Land. 
to keep its conservation and agricultural value. We encourage, uh, we encourage small farmers, because I think that's the way of the future, and also here in the Southwest, other than ranching, large farming, you know, doesn't quite work as well. So those of you who uh, like to mountain bike, and I'm not too familiar with the mountain biking around Prescott, do you have a system of trails here that you ride on? Are they public land, private land? Are they, are they mixed? Does the city own any of them, the county? Well, the national parks. National parks? And yeah, these are private. And yeah, these are private? Anybody here work for a trails group that does any of the work on those? This is corn. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to get wrapped up in this before yeah. before it's all over. All right. So, if you look at some of the pictures, these are some of the areas we are trying to protect. We're trying to add some science to what we do now. For the first 25 years of our existence, we basically took donated easements that came through the door. The people wanted to donate their easement. And we, it was a valuable easement, and sometimes in the distant past, a not too valuable easement, easement, we would take it. Well, we're kind of past the donated stage now. Most of the people who are going to donate to us have already done so. And a lot of our big branches are now busted up into the little 35-acre parcels, which makes it really difficult to put a cost-effective easement on the land. So now we're working in targeting. My friend Shannon got that out just the other day on an East property on the ranch she works on. And I just butchered half of it and it's in my freezer. There are some benefits to this job. So I'm sure not the paycheck. Yeah. But anyway, we're, tar we're starting to target land. We are working, where we're at, we're working with Fort Lewis College, we're working with the field ecology course, the biologists, the geologists, and the historians, and we're allowing them to kind of tell me what do they see as priority areas to be protected. We're also working with Parks and Wildlife, and again, they have priority areas that they want to see protected for various reasons. The only problem we have with them is their various reasons are generally always involving big game. Or we do have some endangered species issues we're dealing with, but generally it's about big game. We're trying to get them to come along and say, you know, there's a little more to parks and wildlife than just big game hunting. So we're working with them. We're working with the uh, Forest Service and the BLM to look at different inholdings that they would consider important for, for their scale of things. What are, they, you know, what are they trying to do in an area? Can we help with a, get a piece of property that will help them out? And so we've, we've passed the stage, like I say, of people donating easements because most of these targeted places we're generally not going to get. People aren't going to donate them. So now it's a course that we're looking in. We have to start looking for funding to do this. And how do you find that kind of funding? It, I hope you guys have some answers, because I should want. I'm waiting for her, her talk, and I'm Very hoping difficult. she'll give me, the, give me the secret. But you know, looking, we have to look at different sources of funding for it. And this is the, this is the part of the job that I don't like quite as much. I like working with landowners, I love being on the land, I love coming out and talking to people and doing education. And looking for funding is a real pain. Especially up in La Plata County, we have 400 nonprofits in one county. So every business you go to in, in Durango, chances are the owner sits on a board of another nonprofit. So it's, it's tough to get money. So we have to go for state agencies. Uh, we go for federal agencies, we go for foundations, and we're just starting that process. And here's where students, and I'm going to make a pitch for some of you. Allison told me that at this college, you guys are kind of free-range students. 
you have options of getting internships and doing classes and not actually being right here in Prescott. And so I'm going to say that if any of you are interested in something like that, working with a land trust, see me afterwards or see Allison to get my contact information. And I'm sure that the, uh, the next land trust to speak is going to ask for the same thing. This is where we have to get creative. This is where I can use new ideas and new thoughts, new ways of doing the things. I need people who are willing to do the homework. And y'all are students. You can do that. You know how to do research. And then put together proposals to help get funding from, from donors. I need people that are willing to also come out and talk to landowners. Not be afraid to talk to landowners. Some of the combinations we're putting together, we have one, one property that I'm targeting is the best wetlands system I have seen around Durango, including there's a couple of fens buried down in it. The owners of the thing are Florida investors. They, uh, they bought the property when pro property values were real high. They didn't do their homework. They thought they could build 20 houses there. Well, since it's a wetland area, they can build five, and that didn't make them happy. And then the bust happened. So we have a piece of property for sale that's prime. I have three neighboring landowners that are willing to kick in, but none of them are rich. I have the state willing to kick in, but we're still not quite there. So I gotta find that other source. And here's where some creative thinking could come in handy. Or a winning lottery ticket. You know, whatever works. Uh, so there's one of the reasons we, we do what we do. So anyway, anyway, do you have any questions right now before I get I don't know, I may get on a soapbox, I may shut up, I don't know what I'm gonna do. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. I wonder if you could give us a little more specific on, on what, on how it works. So, say I'm a landowner and I want to uh, have my property. What is the advantage to me? Is, is it a tax thing? And mm -hmm. just how, I guess I don't know enough about that. Okay. All right. I'll give you uh, a real brief one. Yeah. And it'll vary slightly when the Arizona folks talk. There's well, we're landowners in La Plata County. So. Okay, great. Great. What we do up there is... Let's, uh, how big's your property? 35. Okay, it's 35. And do you know if it is, is it, is it available to subdivided past 35? No, it's on the dry side. It's on the dry side. Mm -hmm. La Plata River frontage. <clears throat> okay, is it next to any other public lands? No. Or is it next to any other eased lands? I don't think so. Uh, <clears throat> it, well, I think there's a conservation easement up at the, on the back side. Maybe so. There is an easement, I think, it abuts on the west. Okay, do you uh, do agriculture there? No. Okay, here's, here's, here's one of our problems. Now, if you were 35 acres and you were over by Lake Durango, where it could be subdivided into five, you could get a huge tax break there. Where you're at, your tax break probably wouldn't equal the cost of putting it in an easement. But. Again, this is the type of place I'm looking for outside funding. We call it conservation buyers to, to help out with that. So, you know, could I honestly say without actually looking at your property, if we could and figuring out exactly where it's at, if you would have an adequate tax break? I can't answer mm -hmm. that right now, but I'd be happy to give you my card and I'd be happy to look at it yeah. down there. And as a general rule, yeah, and kids who are in the class, as a general rule, let's say you have this piece of property here, here's your house, you want to protect this forever, and say you have a couple kids, well say this is up, let's say this is 35 acres, <laughs> and it's at Lake Durango where it's eligible to be cut up into five acre chunks. Well here's where your house and little barn and stuff are, and maybe you want to put in another house for one of your children. So what you're going to do is, you're going to give up the right for these other six five-acre plots. And using, since I'm just finishing this, almost this exact easement, let's say that 
if this was divided fully up and sold that way, you've got a million two. When you give up the value of all of these lots, you're basically giving up, you know, three quarters of your million two. So I think that's somewhere around 800, which I'm wondering I can think at all right now. All right, so you got, so you're giving up the 800, so you've got, you know, they're just kind of evaluating you at 400,000. So what you got is your 800,000. Now that 800,000, you're giving up that so you're getting a property tax break. You're getting a federal break. And in Colorado, you get a state income tax break up to half of this value. Actually, they capped it at 375,000 dollars. So you wouldn't quite get 400, you get 375,000 dollars. Is an income tax break. Assuming that you don't make enough money to need that tax break in a year, what we have up there is we have a market where you can sell those tax credits, 85 cents on the dollar. And so you can put 85 cents on the dollar of that in your pocket in a given year. And of course we encourage people to at least use part of that to even help do some more, you know, conservation projects on their property and stuff. Another thing is depending on where your land is, there could be money from parks and wildlife to do restoration. If you're in a good mule deer area or something like that, there's chunks of money there to help pay for the conservation easements. And also up there we're hitting the oil and gas companies in mitigation. And so they have to give us give us some money for some of this as mitigation fees. So there's possibilities. But given that you don't have much development to give up, we'd have to really sit down and really look hard at what you do have and we could work out, at least give you a ballpark of what you could get out of it. Any other questions? Yes? That's the county plats that up. Oh, okay. In a given area, the county says, in this area, we will allow five acre lots. In some areas, it's three acre lots. In some acre areas, it's a one acre lot. In some areas, like their area, it's a 35 acre lot. So, yeah, the county and county planning in La Plata County is a real oxymoron. <laughs> it doesn't really exist. We have. Uh, we have property owners up there who don't believe in planning, and they have sabotaged every effort to do planning. Sure, that's a fact. We have landowners up there, and I talked in the class a little earlier about this, who believe uh, that what I do is part of the UN plot to take away their property rights, yeah. part of Agenda 21. <laughs> The word sustainability means we're trying to turn them all into socialists and take away their cars and everything else. And so uh, it's, it's kind of a rough, rough go in our county. You probably have some neighbors like that. And I had a discussion. <laughs> this is on the easement I'm putting in. It's going to be in next Tuesday. And it's 900 acres up by Viacito. But I had a discussion with one of those people about that, he said, you take away our rights to do what we want with the land. I said, well, your neighbor has a right to do what he wants with his land, doesn't he? Yeah. Well, he wants to protect his land forever. Well, that's not what I'm talking about. Well, so what you're telling me is, I'm taking away the rights to do with the, with the land what the guy wants, only if you agree with it. And after that, it became more or less kind of spittle and all kinds of stuff just uh, just wasn't working out. <laughs> Scott, isn't that one of your biggest challenges is educating the people of what a land trust really is? Exactly. They, I mean, most people come up to us if we have a little booth up, what are you doing to us now? Yeah. I mean, that's, yep. that's just a common thought. Yeah, it, it is. And, and, you know, they hired me specifically for education yeah. and outreach. And like I was telling uh, Becky and Colleen last night, 
I've been on the job for almost a year now. And I went to the board. I said, okay, I'm working 60 hours a week. Here's what I'm doing. Here's what you hired me for. Can we do something with some of this? And so the board actually, you know, we've just got rid of the bookkeeping. We farmed that out. And so I can get into education and outreach. But, and the education in Durango has been kind of preaching to the choir for years. It's never been out there. So we're changing that. Next year, I am going to have entries in the rodeo parade. We're going to ride in the cowboy poetry gathering. I'm going to be at the rodeo in a booth. All those years as a working cowboy, I can engage them in a conversation. You know, there's a few, like the gentleman I had the little thing with. And like I said today, had I been out working with him, working cows or chopping wood or something, that conversation could have been quite different. But meeting him, you know, in a meeting like I did, it just didn't work. But I think if I go and engage them at the rodeo, and I used to ride Bronx, but I might be a little old for that now, so I, maybe I don't want to go that far. But if I can go there, be in the grand entry parade and do stuff like that, and then meet them where they are. And that's the important thing for, for you young, younger folks to remember. Meet the people where they are. Don't try to just go in and convert them. You know, you've got to go to where they're at, find your common ground, and then go, then work at that. When I was part of the holistic land, land management and we had mediation training and stuff, I remember one instructor said, well, generally you take the environmentalists and the ranchers, you put them in a room with boxing gloves for 24 hours, then they can sit down and talk and you can find your common ground. I don't go quite that far, but, but you know, get, get everything out in front. Get it out in the open. Don't be afraid of the conversation. But you're right, education and outreach is critical. In Durango, which isn't a very big place, I can walk down the street, talk to every resident I meet, less than half of them have ever heard of us. We've been there 25 years. And out of that, less than half of them have any idea what we do. So again, I can use some of you free range students to get out there and, uh, and help me educate. Any other any other questions? Yes. This might be a little off of the land trust that you're talking about. <laughs> I was curious if you could talk a little bit more to your holistic land movement that you were talking about earlier. Like what what particular does that look like? Did it have the, the holistic grazing that you were talking about? Yeah, it, it was a movement. It was a cat cattle in the environmental movement have always had, uh, let's say, a not so great reputation. And actually quite well justified in many cases. You know, there are people out there that have abused the land, they've overgrazed it for one reason or another. Sometimes it's like, well, we had a really dry year, cattle prices were too low, what was he supposed to do, just shoot them? You know, but it, it developed a, a bad reputation. But in part, it's because of the way it was done. So Alan Savory, who was from South Africa, in, I mean not South Africa, but Africa, and what used to be Rhodesia is now Zimbabwe. He was the manager of the national parks there. He was one of the people who went in and did the national parks. And they did it on the American model. They went to this river, riparian place, really beautiful, and they said, this is going to be our national park. And in that area, there were a lot of villages. You know, there were a lot of tribal units living in that area. And so using the American model, they kicked all the people off. Within a few years of kicking the people off, that riparian area was so degraded because the grazing animals now we're much less alert because there weren't people in there hunting them. There weren't people in there forcing them to move. So they just went down to the rivers and hung out. And they trashed the riverbanks. And he started thinking about that. Thinking about man's natural place in the predatory role and things. And then he came to the conclusion of a lot of these systems, 
especially when you get into the savannas and the plains, developed as a, they were just a, a beautiful combination of the plants and the grazing animals that used them. The grazing animals that used them would come in, intensively grave an area, but they were always on the move because there were either wolves, lions, people, whatever, hunting them. And so the grazing was intense, local, and moved on. Whereas our style, when we first opened the West, was kick the cows out and let them go graze wherever they will. So he did a bunch of experiments after he came to this country where they started putting up electric fences and intensely grazing an area and then moving. Some of you have heard of the rotational grazing, which is kind of an earlier system of that. I mean, really super intense. And then we took it even further, mining tailings. You've probably all seen somewhere where there's just a big pile of rock and stuff where there's no, no grass growing on it, no greenery on it. He goes in, he puts electric fence around it, he puts a lot of heavy, heavy hoof livestock in there and feeds them hay right there. They eat the hay, they defecate, they urinate, they churn up the ground, they put organic matter into the soil, and then he moves them on to the next place, and they seed that area, and you're reclaiming mining tailings. Mm -hmm. This is the kind of thing that holistic management, and then it's gone, it's gone much further than that now. We've, got, we've gone into, like uh, we were talking about the Jenner farm today. They rotate the crop systems there. Well, now let's start adding animals to it. You know, we have some chickens, we have, some, we can get pigs, we can get cows, and start rotating them into the system to increase the fertility of the system. Mm -hmm. And this was, you know, this was well proven, and they did a lot of studies, a lot of work, and we had a conference that I went to, and there was a woman there from the Sierra Club, pretty high up in the Sierra Club. And one night after dinner, I was asking her, well, what'd you think? And I think she might have had a little bit too much wine, because she said, well, you know, that, that's really convincing, and I'm glad to see that, you know, you've done this work, but it's not in our best interest to promote this. Because being anti-cow was a guaranteed fundraiser for them. Wow. And so then you get into politics and money, and what's best for the land kind of falls by the wayside. So, I mean, I'm sure she thought that they were looking for the bigger picture. If they had lots of money, they could protect more land, but that's kind of being dishonest. Mm -hmm. So anyway, since the slideshow's over, then I must be out of time. <laughs> but I'll be happy to take questions after, uh, after it's all done, and uh, I'll be around all evening, so I'm happy to talk to, talk to folks, and I definitely want to see you folks and give you my card, and we can get together back home. All right, well, thanks. So when uh, <coughs> someone went up on Thumb Butte with a bulldozer and carved out a home site, and the town came out of their houses and thought and said, oh, we thought that was Forest Service property. Well, no, it was all private property. So we were able to work with the city of Prescott to raise about $450,000, and we were able to buy six slots at the base of Thumb Butte and um, the, those are owned by the city and protected by the Central Arizona Land Trust. So that's an example of what land trusts do. That's a small piece of property, but it was a huge view shed for this entire area that was very, very important to the town. So that really gave rise to what we know now as the Central Arizona Land Trust. I got involved um, then and then even more so around the mid 90s when I joined the board and um, just by way of background, I went to Prescott College in the dark ages. <laughs> I um, have spent about 40 years of my life as a child advocate, kind of a social scientist rather than a biological scientist. But I'm really interested in saving open space and being able to pass things on to future generations that are very special here in central and northern Arizona. And so I, in my uh, spare time, I work with a group of people, some of whom are present, on the board of the Central Arizona Land Trust to do this work. So, next slide. 
You're right, Scott. It's a miracle you didn't hobble yourself. So um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about land protection tools. And Scott told you about some of the things that they're doing in La Plata and uh, some of the challenges they have with the public perception of what a land trust is. We run into the same thing here. Only in Arizona, people think we are the state trust lands group or, a or agency. That's a governmental agency which holds and controls st state trust lands. And it has nothing to do with state with land trusts. One is a private entity, one is a public governmental entity, and they have very, very different jobs. Um, in Arizona, in northern Arizona, you can go ahead, next slide. We've really chosen to try to focus on grasslands, largely on grasslands, um, mainly because grasslands are the lungs of the countryside. They um, support riparian areas, they support a number of important species in our area, but they also are the fastest disappearing form of land in our county and in our state, except for the fragile de desert down south. And there's a couple of uh, land trusts down south, the McDowell Sonoran Land Trust, the Arizona Open uh, Lands and Water Trust, and one other, oh, Carefree Cave Creek has a land trust. There's several land trusts down in the desert that are doing a lot of good work down there. But CULT, the Central Arizona Land Trust, is the only nonprofit qualified organization in Central and Northern Arizona who can actually hold uh, conservation easements. And that is our mission statement. We had a discussion at the last board meeting that we really think we will add um, to the working lands phrase right there, working agricultural lands, because those are um, going fast, and it has been said that in the next 10 years, in this part of the country, ran most ranches will have changed hands, either to development or to heirs of current landowners. Most of the ranches in our area were um, ranches that started in the 1800s, early 1900s, when that was a sustainable form of economic um, livelihood. It is no longer a sustainable form of economic livelihood, and as you may have noticed, many ranches in this area are now sort of like boutique ranches with giant subdivision signs on them, and they're going 35, 40 acres a pop. So we're looking to work with local landowners to protect some of those places, not all of those places. Next slide. And um, this is obviously a map of the northern part of Arizona. And it's all this country that we're really interested in working in branching out from where we are now in Prescott. Um, there are several um, ranch properties up north around Flagstaff that are of great interest to us. The Verde Valley has a number of very prime properties that we'd love to work with landowners on. And um, we are, as I say, the only land trust north of Maricopa County. Next slide. So we're a private nonprofit. Most of you know what a 501c3 is. It's a tax-exempt organization. That doesn't mean we can't make money. It does mean that we don't have to pay taxes on our income. And those who donate to us receive, may, can receive some tax benefit from their donation. Um, and that's the classification that the IRS makes for nonprofit, some nonprofit organizations. And as I said, we were founded in 89 just by local citizens getting together. We worked at that time with the Trust for Public Land. Their closest office right now is in Santa Fe, and they came over and um, helped us really um, form as a nonprofit and determine what our mission was and get started on raising money for um, to save some butte. And that was a very public project and one which uh, was very successful. So what we do is we work with local landowners who are interested in protecting family lands, 
property that they own in perpetuity. They're interested in protecting it from development. Not all properties meet the, the test of properties that can have the development rights donated. And there's a very specific criteria with the IRS and um, as part of our due, due, due diligence where the conservation values have to be clearly defined and the public benefit has to be clearly defined. In other words, land trusts are not in the business of helping people manage their real estate. Land trusts are in the business of helping people protect forever property that they do not want developed. So it's a very different kind of a transaction than um, something that, that would be more real estate focused. And um, in order to prove those values, we have to do um, baseline studies and document everything that is a conservation value on a said property. And um, frankly, we work much more eagerly and willingly on larger landscapes than on small ones. Protecting 35 acres takes as much due diligence, almost as much in the way of transaction costs, and as many moving parts, legally and financially, as 3,500 acres. And when you're a small local land trust and you have finite resources, which we all do now, we're much more interested in working in larger, uh, larger landscapes than protecting small, smaller places that have more development pressure. Um, the economic benefits to um, everyone, really, not only the landowner, is that sometimes protected lands can have higher value as conservation lands than they had as development property. That has started happening in places like Montana where there's actually conservation buyers. Scott referred to that earlier. A conservation buyer is someone who's looking for land that already has not only conservation values, but is already legally protected from development. So they don't have in mind, I'm gonna buy a ranch and 10, 20 years down the road, we'll subdivide it make a bunch of money and, you know, we'll live on one small part and the rest of it will be ranchettes. They have a very different value, which is they want to own large swaths of protected land. Ted Turner is probably the best example, the best known example of a conservation buyer, and he's bought properties all over South and North America that are conservation properties. So bully for Ted. Um, Economic benefits of open space and, and protected lands, they also serve as great resources for tourism, recreation, and education. Um, it increased value of nearby properties, as I mentioned, can occur, doesn't always occur, but it can occur, especially over time. It certainly promotes a sense of place in communities, and it has that public benefit test, and that's really the number one test that the IRS looks at, I think, in terms of whether or not a project qualifies for the tax incentives that may be involved is public benefit. Next. So um, Yavapai County land ownership, believe it or not, this county is the size of the state of Massachusetts. It's very, very large as counties go, but only 25% of it is privately held. The rest of it is held by a combination of federal and state agencies. So those agencies manage those lands that they control for certain purposes. Private land is obviously controlled by the private landowner, but there's really a small percentage of our county that is um, in even able to be talked about as, as um, possible conservation. And you'll see the big, see the big white square kind of off to the left side of Yapai County. Anybody know what that is? <laughs> yeah, that is a Spanish land grant that was gifted to a family that owns silver mines in the northern Mexico Cananea area, and um, it was it's a it's what 
How many miles? 40 miles on the side. 40 miles square. So it is, a, it is an enormous piece of private land, and now it's owned by a gentleman who lives in New York City, and I don't know that he even gets out here every year. But it's now called the ORO Ranch, and um, it's a beautiful place that is very, very ginormous and privately owned and probably will be for a long, long time. Next. So, land protection methods. So they, um, conservation easements are what we mainly uh, work with in terms of the toolkit for conservation. And the word easement is kind of misleading because when you hear the word easement, I think of power lines and permission to cross somebody's property with a little road so you can get to your property. And that's really not what conservation easements are at all. In fact, conservation easements can be created on property that's privately owned with no public access whatsoever. So it, probably the term conservation agreement is more appropriate because it's an agreement between the landowner and a nonprofit organization that's qualified to hold basically the value of the development rights that have been donated by the landowner. The landowner keeps ownership of the land, keeps control of the land, and sets the conditions for the conservation easement. So um, the benefit, as Scott gave you that example, that tax credit of $800,000, which could be on this hypothetical property, is something that some large landowners would like to have to take a portion of that credit every year for say 15 years. And the IRS allows that kind of tax, um, tax relief for some landowners who have very large tax liabilities because they have what? Very large incomes. So it stands to reason then if you think about that, few people today who own property, especially in Yavapai County, which is agricultural property, have large incomes. <laughs> so it's hard to find those places and those landowners that are really interested in doing long-term conservation and protection those landowners that are coming up against that 10-year time window in their own life cycle, in their own family's life, where they know that within the next 10 or 20 years, their property is going to move, ownership of that property is going to move to the next generation. Those people are faced with an enormous dilemma. Does anybody know what that is? It's called estate tax. And many ranching families today cannot afford to let their property go to their heirs. Their heirs can't afford the property taxes and the estate taxes to inherit the ranch. And that often adds additional pressure to landowners to subdivide or sell off their property so that the value of the property can be divided amongst the heirs because the heirs can't afford to inherit the property once the original landowner passes on. So it, it really is a financial pressure to them, to those families, and land con conservation easements can remove some of the value of that estate and can make it actually economically feasible in some cases, and every case is different, for the heirs to inherit the property once the value of the develop, development is removed from the property. So that's another way in which um, conservation easements can benefit landowners. And um, one of the things that we do with landowners is addressing all present and future desired uses. So that if it's an agricultural land, uh, conservation easement, grazing, um, all kinds of agriculture, certain home sites, barns, irrigation, all kinds of things can be built into the conservation easement so that they are allowed uses of that property going forward. It can be a very flexible tool. 
Costs related to the transaction and future ownership are typically the landowners. So this is a very expensive proposition because there's a jillion little moving parts that um, all cost somebody money to get property from um, its um, developable state into uh, conservation easement. And typically those are called transaction costs that are paid for by the landowner. And then oftentimes when landowners are trying to arrange a conservation easement, they're also informed, guess what? We'll need an endowment to protect your property in perpetuity because 25, 50 years down the road, one of your heirs might violate the terms of the easement and then we would have to defend it legally. So an endowment has to come along with the property in most cases, and it's one of our policies that we don't accept conservation easements without transaction costs and endowments that come with them. All right, next. So there's a little more on conservation easements, and I think you all are probably glassy-eyed enough. You've probably had <laughs> enough of this stuff. But um, it uh, just suffice it to say that it is, um, it is complicated work, but it's not, um, it's not extremely challenging work. It's work that anybody can get their head around. You just need to um, really understand all the ins and outs of it before you, before you start so that landowners know exactly what they're getting into well, well in the beginning of the relationship, the conversation. If they find out six months down the road, oh, by the way, you're paying the transaction costs and we need an endowment worth X, Y, Z percentage of the value of the property, probably going to kill your deal. Next. So, um, nonprofit organizations, some federal land agencies, state, local, um, state, county, or cities that have um, enabling um, policies can hold easements. Although with um, federal agencies, state and local agencies, those are usually, um, policy is usually set within those agencies by elected people. And um, therefore, the whim of that governmental body may change over time. And um, conservation easements that are held by nonprofit organizations that can sustain their stewardship role for a long, long time are much safer places to have conservation easements because zoning is inadequate and political bodies are not always of the same mind to hold easements for the original purpose they were intended. Next. So some of the benefits, again, um, landowners are really in charge. They decide what they want done with their land. They can craft an agreement and um, it can even allow limited development in some cases. If the landowner needs to engage in some development in order to um, protect another part of the land, that's, that's a possibility as long as the conservation values are present on the property. Next. Landowners can sell the land, they can bequeath the land, um, and uh, Local governments, for instance, well, I think this is maybe even be the next slide. That's more tax stuff. Go ahead. Okay, so on this one, um, I think first we're going to see the W. This is um, looking out over off some view now. No, this towards Skull Valley. No, this is looking uh, out towards uh, uh, hillside. Off what prominent prominent? Uh, this is from Kirkland Peak. Okay, from Kirkland Peak. You can tell who's a photographer in the audience. <laughs> Matt Turner. Okay, go ahead. So the W Diamond Ranch is where the Prescott College Community Farm is, and um, that's owned by Dave and Kay Jenner. And in 2009, they donated a conservation easement on over 4,000 acres of their ranch. And that easement um, is the largest single one that we accepted. And um, it was accepted 
with them paying all the transaction costs and donating a small, really a relatively modest endowment for uh, protection of that conservation easement in perpetuity. And each year, a little bit of that endowment money is pulled off to pay someone to do the annual monitoring and make sure that no, none of the terms of the easement have been violated over the year and that the terms of the easement in terms of wildlife and uses of the land are still protected and there's been no violations. So that's an example that um, I know you all are familiar with if you've been to the farm. Next. In Granite Dells, and this was the example I was thinking of before, um, Sherman Payne donated about 32 acres of just absolutely gorgeous property where his family has lived for a long, long time in Granite Dells. And the fee, the ownership of that land was donated to the city of Prescott. The conservation easement was donated to the Central Arizona Land Trust. So we, we hold the conservation easement to protect that property from violations that were set forth in the conservation easement. And one of the wonderful things about this easement is that those are the trails that you ride your bikes on and hike on that provide access between Granite Dells and Watson uh, Lake Trails, Peavine, um, the, uh, there's several new trails back in there now, the shoot trail, or the flute, flute, flume trail, and a couple other trails that the city has developed. And um, Scott, you asked earlier, are any of you the trail builders or maintainers from around here? Those guys are tucked into bed. For the most part, they're about 70, 65, 70 years old. They're called the Over the Hill Gang. And every Monday, they're out on one of the trails around here um, making just huge improvements, doing wonderful things with trail building and trail maintenance as a volunteer gang. So they're really great guys, great guys. Um, but that's an example of where the city holds the actual fee on the property, but we hold the conservation easement, and obviously the public benefit of all that is enormous. Next. Up north, um, Dan Campbell encouraged us to use this slide, although this uh, conservation easement is held, I believe, by the Nature Conservancy. He actually couldn't remember. But um, this is almost 35,000 acre, 35, acres of a private ranch owned by the Babbitt family who came here and established trading posts all over the reservation in the late 1800s and are still uh, merchants up in northern Arizona as well as ranchers. And this CE was donated, um, a very, very large CE was donated, um, and the fee was donated to Coconino County, and um, the CE is either held by the Nature Conservancy still, or actually by Coconino County, I'm not sure which. But that's an example of a public-private partnership which obviously saved thousands of acres of ranch land from development. And the Babbitt's intention is to have all of their ranches under conservation easement eventually. That's really been a stated intention of their family corporation. Next. So, um, okay, next. What did I leave in there? Oh, a couple more tools for conservation. Um, do, do outright donation of property um, can have um, tax benefits as well as um, placing some deed restrictions on property, although still there, there are, these are kind of technical issues, so I won't go into them. Next. Um, purchase of development rights is something that we'd really very much like the county of Yavapai to develop a program for, and that would mean that public money is used to buy development rights on large properties, possibly ranches, that otherwise couldn't be protected because the landowners can't afford to do it and there's no other direct funding source. So the county of Yavapai could use public dollars to purchase um, development rights from properties with key conservation values within the county 
Um, and we hope that as the board moves from three supervisors to five supervisors, maybe several of them will be much more interested in this idea than they have been so far. Next. <laughs> So we'll give them this slideshow soon. Next. So these are some reasons why we want the county to consider all that so that they can control growth and really control, a lot of it has to do with controlling sprawl in our county. As you know, we're um, really close to a tipping point when it comes to sprawl and, and um, wildcat subdivisions and wells being poked here and hither and yon. Next. There's a couple of funding sources for PDRs. Next. Next. So, benefits of open space, they're all there. Obviously, the greatest benefit of open space is having open spaces to enjoy for not only your children, but your children's children and their children. Perpetuity ends up to be a very long time. Next. So, I thought this was really clever. Did you do this, Matt? I did. It was really good. <laughs> so, a recipe for land protection. One part family lands protected from development in perpetuity. One part local land trust stewardship. One part public land benef pu public benefit. Stir in equal parts of scenic values, wildlife habitat, ecotourism, community for agriculture, New models for sustainable land use add predominantly private funding. Viola, open space preserved for future generations. Ta-da! <laughs> so that is very good. And um, I talked to a rancher from New Mexico one time. You know who he is, I know, Scott. But, um, and he, his counter to the private property rights argument is, Conservation easements are the highest and best use of property, private property rights, because if landowners want to protect their property for future generations, that's the tool to do it, and it has both public benefits and benefits to the landowner. So we can just argue it is the highest and best use and no pinko commie plot. <laughs> to take questions if you have any. Yes? I was wondering if you could speak to um, kind of the history of uh, legislation that has allowed um, such things as conservation easements, if that makes sense. Well, in Arizona? Yeah, in Arizona. Or um, I, I can make this very brief. Scott probably knows a lot more about this than I do. The first land trust was organized in Vermont in the late 1800s. So this is not a new movement. This is a movement that's been around for a long time. There are about 1,400 land trusts in the country today. And in terms of land trust policy development in Arizona, that has occurred in the last 20 years. There has not been much in the way of, Arizona has, a a very large percentage of its property in public domain, not in private use. 85% of our state is publicly held land. So it's, it's a rather short tenure, and Arizona does not have state tax benefit, like Scott described, for um, conservation easement donation. They, they're, the legislature, certain members of the legislature who are ranchers have, have entertained this thought, but no legislation, to my knowledge, has ever been introduced. So it's a very nascent thing in terms of political or public policy, with Cocon probably Coconino County and Pima County being the most um, progressive. Everything. Everything. So like I'm doing one right now for the city on the big genome. And you you're you're looking at the biological component, you're looking at the infrastructure, you're looking at water rights and mineral rights, you're looking at everything that is visible on the surface and you're characterizing it 
you're mapping it GIS, you're photographing it, and it's all integrated into a nice little two-page report. <laughs> <laughs> you hope. No. So and then, that's and then each year what's yeah. compared what you do is is compare the current state of, a, of what's on the land to the baseline. Everything refers back to the baseline to make sure that there have been no violations. 